Ahoy there, Captain Benzie here, coming at you with something very different to usual. Again, don't worry, I'm not quitting Eve Echoes. Just, this is a game, Pascal's Wager, that I've wanted to talk about on my channel for an awful long time. Any folks who know me will know that I'm a massive fan of From Software's games, the so-called Souls-likes, although that is a genre name that really needs replacing with something much better. Dark Souls, Demon Souls, and Bloodborne are some of my absolute favourite games of all time, notably Bloodborne on that, especially with Return to Yharnam going on at the moment. I literally have three characters I'm currently doing playthroughs on there, and heck, if I had a way to properly record, I would probably have done an entire YouTube channel dedicated to nothing but Bloodborne, Dark Souls, and Demon Souls, again, if that weren't content that has already been beaten to death repeatedly. But, ultimately, here on mobile, I've been looking for a good Souls-like game for a long time. I've had Anima, and I've had Grim Valor that have kind of tickled that itch, but of course, of course, Pascal's Wager was released. This is the game we're going to be talking about today. Now, I actually got super excited about this when I saw it on iOS, when it launched on Android. I pre-ordered it, I grabbed it day of release, and then I never got round to playing it for some reason. And here we are, months later, me finally jumping into this and actually talking about it. I played a, a few hours of this over the weekend, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Like, the first area and the first boss I thought were absolutely fantastic. I started to go through the second area, and again, it just keeps getting better and better. So I thought, you know what, no, I'm going to stop this, we're going to jump into a new game on this channel, and I'm going to talk about this game and kind of do a let's play from start to finish. This will be outside of my Eve Echoes content, mostly, but it does mean if we have a particularly quiet week or I'm unable to get online to play Eve Echoes, for example, we can jump into a bit of Pascal's Wager, so I'm kind of going to make a load of these as a buffer and release them as the time goes, and I do hope you guys will enjoy this journey as much as I am. Now, before we jump in, of course, as usual, if you do enjoy this video, let me know by hitting like on it, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more like this, and of course, comment down below, especially. If you enjoy this, let me know. This is one of those things that I really want to kind of showcase, and um, I want to talk about it an awful lot, um, and I really want you guys to sort of get a feel for this game as well. So if you enjoy watching this, let me know, and I will keep making more of it. If no one watches this and hates it, well, I'll probably still put it out, but hey, there we go. Um, and of course, as well, if you do want to support the channel, we have a Patreon and a Redbubble site um, for merchandise. And I am going to be looking to kind of, as I said, diverge a bit from Eve Echoes. I'm not leaving Eve Echoes anytime soon, but I did just want to diverge a little bit and talk about some other games that I really enjoy from time to time too. And eventually, if that does take off enough, I may launch a second YouTube channel dedicated for that. Anyway, without further ado then, this is Pascal's Wager. Now for the most part, I am going to skip through the cutscenes and through the dialogue because I can't record my voice and the in-game sounds, which is super disappointing. Now, graphically, as you can tell, this is a pretty good-looking video game for mobile. This is a mobile game we're looking at here. I'm playing this on mobile, screen recording on mobile, edited on mobile, as you guys know, but I am using my Razer Jungle Cat controller. Um, the on-screen controls actually aren't bad. The touch controls are not bad at all. Um, but I just like an excuse to break out my Jungle Cat from time to time. And again, just, it's such a pretty game. Like... I would not have expected a mobile game to look this pretty, and it, I'm just super, super impressed by that. Anyway, so we, of course, we have our standard light attacks, which are done with, essentially, R1. We have a dodge, we have the ability to block. It's going to tell me about the central bones, which are how we level up. And we've got dodge, we've got block, and we have heavy attacks. But if you can see that, the heavy attacks have the longest wind-up in history. Like, literally, they are insane. The game is beautiful, the sound direction for the most part as well is really impressive. I love the sort of the sound effects of using items, the combat sound effects all feel you know particularly meaty. It's you know it's it's a lot of fun on that side of things. However, the sound direction is massively let down by the voice acting. Now I understand that this is an Asian team, so it's not like I'm sitting here expecting like absolutely perfect. I know it's a fairly small team as well, so I'm not expecting them to go off and hire the likes of Cam Clark or you know uh, Peter Dinklage or something to you know do the voiceovers. But my goodness, it suffers from what I call Diablo throat. Which is when apparently everyone has been gargling acid and everyone has to talk like this. No one can say things in a normal voice. It's got to be all gruff and moody and rrrr. And it just gets a little bit old really quickly. On top of that as well, a lot of the voice acting is just... I don't know. 
I don't know, it just feels off. I'm not just talking about, like, accent or something here. I'm not going down that route. What I am saying is that just it feels like the voice actors were hired as the first people who could do a remotely English accent. Um, and they just, it was almost like they were shown the script the first time as they op went into the recording booth. It, a lot of it's really flat and really quite bland, you know, it, it's like they're not really putting much effort into the voice acting at all. Like, genuinely, I look, I, I wanted to be a voice actor when I was a kid, and the fact that I basically get to play games like this on YouTube and talk to people about them and showcase it is, you know, it's, it's something I'm really fond of. What I may do here, actually, is just to give you an example, is I will pick up some of this recording, I'll do another quick character, record some of the voice acting, um, and play it as a little break here, just to showcase really how bad this is. How's everything over there? Hajim is fading much faster than we thought. This place is completely contaminated by syndroles. In the village, there are only some marred monsters. I guess they were Hajim's disciples. It's so flat, and it just feels really stilted and weird at times. Like, you know, have you gone to the top of the mountain yet? No, I was going to go to the top of the mountain, but then I got distracted. You should go to the top of the mountain, because I think that's where you'll find the answers to the questions. And it's just... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that though, I love it, and I love the new systems as well. So obviously this thing here is an altar. This is your bonfire, or your lantern, or your sculptor's idol, or whatever the heck you want to call it from whatever Souls-like game you've been playing. It is, of course, the place where you rest and do all the things. Now, it's interesting to see here that the resting is optional. Here I am. If I rest, obviously I'm going to respawn all the enemies, but I'm not resting at the moment. None of the enemies have respawned. I haven't gained health. You have to manually choose to do that. Obviously, if you rest, you restore everything you're going to be carrying. You carry all your new health potions. Um, your health and stamina are all fully uh, increased. Um, your sanity is increased, which is a really cool system that I'll come back to later. But it is optional as to whether or not you do that. When it comes to leveling up, this is like Dark Souls 1. You level up directly at your altar. You come onto the menu here, and you get different types of bones, like bone fragments, large bones, and on a quick press of the Y button, you can dedicate some of these to the altar. And if you dedicate enough, you achieve a level up, at which point I can go in and every character that I have, I can upgrade their stats. And of course, it's the usual uh, things like strength, dexterity, intellect, endurance, vigor, and vitality. I think the only thing missing there really is faith. Um, but interestingly as well, it's also arcane resistance, which I, I quite like. It's not just magic, it's arcane. It's got a little bit of Bloodborne flavour in there. Um, as you, as I said, you do get other characters in this as well. You're not playing as Terence the entire time. There are other characters like Viola, the woman you've seen with her rifle, the blonde woman running around with us. Um, she is playable in certain aspects, and you unlock other characters through the game as well. I won't spoil too much of that. Um, when you level up an altar, everyone levels up. Everyone gets that point to level up with it, which is, I think, really cool. It means you don't have to grind on a particular character. You also get the option to make stuff here at these altars, so alchemy here, elixirs of uh, sanity, I think this is probably then a good point to talk about the sanity system, you can see I've got not enough materials to make these. Basically, the uh, when you fight enemies, because of the mental effects of fighting enemies that were essentially people at one point, your sanity does decrease, and when your sanity gets low enough, you enter an abnormal state. I'm currently sitting in an abnormal state, you can see sort of the, the glowing around the edge of the screen, plus there's a red flashing sanity sanity icon in the middle there, saying I'm low sanity. This will change certain effects. You can see it's capped off some of Terence's HP. He has lower HP when he's abnormal, but I think he generates rage faster or he has more damage. I think it actually tells you here. Let's have a look. Abnormal effect. Cannot dodge continuously, reduce maximum health by 30, but increases damage by 10%. And you can upgrade um, how your abnormal affects you later on as well. You also get these trophies. Trophies are a really cool little thing. They're just little items that you equip. Rather than having like armor and weapons, because your characters are equipped with what they're equipped with and you're stuck with that for the entire game you never upgrade Terence's swords as far as I've seen what you do instead is you upgrade trophies and you get scar trophies which tend to be things like your attacks you get the nightmare trophies which tend to affect things like your sanity um, and then you get resistance trophies which of course are defensive based so it's kind of like armor weapon and mind upgrades there like with other souls like games as well a lot of this is told through items um, so you do have to read a lot of item descriptions to get an, art, you know, an idea of what's going on. 
We then have an inventory where, of course, we can set things to a quick bar and we can look through all these different things. So the Elixir of Sanity is an important one to start with. You can set that to your quick action bar and you use those basically um, to get sanity back when you have been in combat if you want to leave the abnormal state or stop yourself going into it. Anyway, I am going to rest at this particular one because I've only killed a couple of enemies and I don't really care to you know, worry too much about that. And we're going to proceed onwards. Now, again, the level design in a Soulsborne, I think, is always an important aspect of the game. I think there are some brilliant Soulsborns out there that are let down by lacklustre level design. Now, this is level design done, Souls-like level design done right, in my opinion. Um, ultimately, the levels loop in and around themselves a lot. You will open up shortcuts, you open up new altars that of course do all kinds of things. Um, these are your uh, like your merchants, these are Sifflers with terrible voice acting again, but hey, on we go. Um, the levels sort of like they go around each other. Like here you can see that's where I started. Like there's the bridge that you saw me go under at the start of the level. And you've got these different routes and you'll find little secret paths, little secret items hidden all over the place. So here we go, let's dodge out of the way of his attacks. Light attacks for the most part are good enough. We're just going to poke him with light attacks until he goes down. There we go. I do like as well, you get a little flash um, on your screen. Your screen goes dark when your stamina is low. So if I just keep attacking, you'll see there, it kind of lets you know you're out of stamina. And I think that's a really awesome system that could have been much, much more useful in other Soulsborne games as well. Um, other Souls-like games where you kind of run out of stamina and you're like, um, what's going on here? You know, it gives you a big visual representation. I'm going to skip through all of this. Basically, I'm being asked by an egg to go get a stone that will help the guy inside it escape. Yeah, it's pretty weird. It's a pretty weird game for stuff like that, but it, it, it is what it is. Anyway, so let's uh, continue through and poke these guys. It's a really nice system. I quite like that you get that little alert that the stamina... Uh, your stamina bar has depleted. I think it's just a really nice little addition. And of course, as we go around, we're going to pick up some items. You see there's some sort of secret areas like up there. How on earth are we going to get there? Well, you'll find out later. Yellowing Diary is something that... Um, oh, here's one of the characters. Um, creepy looking guy in a mask with only one arm. And a massive coffin on his back. And I skipped that too early so you didn't get to see that. No, oh, oops. Anyway, we're going to do a plunging attack, because those are a thing. I think they've been a thing in every Souls-like game since the original introduced you to the Asylum Demon. Um, there we are, and down he goes, nice and quick and easy. Um, and we have some other little secrets around as well. Now, you may have seen earlier on, there was a little frog over here that I spoke to. These are called Heggies, which is a terrible name, but there we go. Um, and you can essentially give items to those. You need to find out which of the items they're actually interested in, um, whether it's like sanity, health potions, or the bone shards. Give them enough of the item that they're interested in, and they give you this really cool item. I can't remember what it's called now. Um, let's have a look in the inventory. It's got a really cool looking name to it as well. There we are, Dominator Crystal. And you can trade these in for items later on that are really powerful. We've got another Siffler. There as well in the corner with his lantern, ready to sell us stuff and steal all our items. Here we go. For the early enemies, pretty much light attack, light attack, light attack is all you need to worry about. And if I tap left on the D-pad, I can do a quick heal. There we go. I'm going to hold L2, and that allows me to swap my quick items. I'm going to swap to throwing knives, because I know there's an enemy here hiding on the roof, and I'm going to do a quick L2, a quick L2 to throw a knife at him and send him falling down so then we can stab him in the face and kill him off that way. Nice and easy. There we are, let's loot those items. I have missed a quest NPC at some point. He's around here, I think. Um, you also get these options that you're going to come back to these areas later on in the game. You're not stuck, like once you've completed an area, that it, it's, it's more level based than Dark Souls. It's kind of got almost a Demon Souls vibe to it there. Um, you do eventually get to come back to these levels and you can use these bells here um, to, for the, to call the coachman to you and you can use that as a new starting point. So when I come back to Hegum here, I can come in from this angle. And it's really cool. I do like that. I quite liked how Demon Souls did that whole you can just explore numerous areas. It means every single area is unique in and of itself and doesn't have to be done with the idea that you could be running through it multiple times in multiple directions. It's a controversial point again, but I think a lot of people kind of... when. <sighs> Like the original Dark Souls, Blight Town specifically. Um, in Blight Town, in the original Dark Souls, there are enemies that th like spit poison darts at you. 
and they only appear once. When you've killed the enemy, that's it, it's dead forever. And why is it dead forever once you've killed it the first time? Well, basically, ooh, crikey, ee, I'm talking too much. Um, basically, because if you're going backwards through the area, um, they're really hard to avoid and you're just going to get poisoned. If you're coming down through the area the first time, you can just run around and kill them all and you never have to deal with them again. It's, it's, it's a point where basically the level design was sacrificed, I need a uh, sanity potion, where the level design was sacrificed in order to basically make allowances for the fact that you go through Blight Town both downwards and upwards in both directions. It, it's, it's a worse area because you have to go through it multiple times, whereas here, every level is completely insular. We only have to worry about it this one direction, this one time. Once the level has been done, it is complete. We are done with the level, and we don't have to worry about it. And damn, I'm taking a beating there. We're locked onto the wrong person, for starters, which is not a great place to be. Please don't shoot me and kill me. Use another health potion quickly! Quickly use the health potion. Drink, 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 drink. There we go. Now we're going to stab this guy repeatedly. I'm going to go abnormal, because of course I am. Ah! Oh my goodness, what is going on with me? I'm playing like an absolute lunatic today, like not in a good way. Anyway, let's kill him. We're going to drink the other one of my sanity potions there. And we're going to run all the way back up. It's because I'm, I'm trying to give you all these really powerful like points about Dark Souls that no one else has ever thought of. Um, but yeah, I quite like the fact that it is level-based design. You kind of do everything you need to in a level, you move on to the next one. You can come back if you think there's stuff you've missed, but as far as I've seen so far, once you've done with a level, once you've kind of 100%ed it, that's it, that's the level done. You move on to the next area and proceed on with your life. There is DLC that I see is accessed via one of the levels, so I suppose if you got the DLC after completing that particular stage, you are going to go back there and do that again. Anyway, let's see if we can actually get past these guys right now. I should probably be using block a bit more. It's a, I'm, a, I'm a Bloodborne player at heart. I forget that uh, blocking is a thing when someone gives me a dodge button. Anyway, there we go. There's the archer. He is now dead, 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 dead. We're going to pick up all these juicy items and we're going to talk to literally the worst voice acted character in gaming history like my goodness yeah here we are it's uh i can never remember what the crow's name is um it's the woman up ahead it doesn't even sound like a woman it sounds like a man doing like a woman's voice i came out to find jerry he left the mine by himself it's dangerous outside my dear jerry he went outside to play with the john brothers but he hasn't been back for two days. He's too playful. And just, it, it's terrible. It's terrible. This is probably a point where, again, I will pause the video and I will just put a couple of, of this woman's dialogue um, and sort of leave it to it. Jerry! Her son, Jerry! You've got to find out what happened to Jerry! He was playing with the John brothers and now he's gone! It, it's awful. It is genuinely awful. The first time I came through here, I was uh, I, I lost a mouthful of drink. I spat my drink out. It was that awful. Like, it, it's genuinely... This game is amazing, but then the voice actors open their mouths and it's just, oh, why? You have such a cool game and instead, you're... you're, you're oh, man. You've got such a cool game, brilliant sound design in every other direction, just some of the worst voice acting in history. Like, okay, the, the original Resident Evil? Like, the original Resident Evil is renowned for terrible voice acting. This game somehow almost does it worse. Like, I'm not sure if it actually does do it worse, or if it's, uh... The Resident Evil one, it's, it's so bad, it's actually kind of funny. This is just bad. It's not so bad, it's funny. It's just cringy bad. And I, I, I feel really let down by that. It's like this would be a freaking amazing game were it not for that one point. And I almost feel like I'm being racist saying it because it's like it's an Asian team. I get that the script written in English isn't going to be overly fantastic. But at that point, you kind of accept your the fact that there is a weakness there. Um, like if I was to write a game and launch it in Japan, I would expect to hire a Japanese localization team. And I just think the English localization here is, it, it's, it's rough. It's really, really rough. 
Anyway, so, I've, I've talked a lot about how the game actually works um, and what it's like. I think it's worth talking a little bit about the story. Well, when the game jump, jumps you in, there's not really any story going on. It's a Souls-like game, of course, vague story appears to be part of the point. Um, that doesn't need to be part of the point, though, in a Souls-like. I, I think sometimes uh, you can have a Souls-like and tell a really good story with it. I think Sekiro did that really well. It told a good, fun story. But it had a lot of additional stuff that you could break up under the surface and grab if you read the item descriptions. The vague storytelling doesn't need to be part of it. Here, you just kind of get dropped in and you're told that Hegem's light is fading and there's something about colossuses or colossi or whatever you want to call them. Um, colossi and something called the Colossal Grave, and the fact that light is fading, and then there's a witch, and it, there's a lot of stuff thrown at you, and it's like, what the hell's going on? Then you start to see your first Colossus, and you're like, okay, actually, that's pretty cool, and it's a really cool concept. It's like a world where the sun has gone out, and it is lit only by these creatures, these massive creatures called Colossi, the Colossus. And it seems that those Colossuses, Colossi, are dying, and that's, you are a courier going to find out kind of what's going on, but Terence as well is looking for this woman um, called Teresa. Ow. This woman called Teresa, and you're sort of sent in to find out what's going on there. Um, and it's just, uh, it's, it, it gets interesting. Like, the storyline at first, when I first played this um, over the weekend, I was like, this, this storyline, what the hell is actually going on here? Um, eat the egg of the bearer. No, we don't want to do that. You'll see I now have a tear stone, which I can now save the guy in the egg. Um, and we have um, the, we got the coat, which I think is supposed to be Jerry's coat. Um, so we can go and let Jerry's mother know that the John brothers have turned into Mard and apparently have killed Jerry, or he's turned into Mard, uh, Mard as well. Now, Mard appear to... they're these the weird lizard sort of things. Not the shell people, the weird lizard-like things um, that you've seen around. They appear to be, basically, what happens when humans like, are, are, are left without the light of the Colossus. They seem to turn into these Amard. Amard, there's there's Eve coming through. Now, there are some secrets in this level. Um, I'm looking at my clock, and I do want to kind of keep most of these. Let's make a sinister claw. I don't have enough. I don't have the broken armor. Um, I kind of want to make most of these videos about 30 minutes long each. So we're coming up to about, I think, the 25 minute mark now. So I'm not going to do the full part of this level. We are going to go and have a look at the boss first of all, and then given the possibility I will then come back and we'll, in our next part we'll have a look at the rest of Hedgem um, and have a look at some of the secrets. So here is our first boss. Now I did okay against this guy first time through on normal, those are the mod there, the list of things I was talking about. I did, through, I did okay on this guy on casual, sorry, I did a quick casual run over the weekend. Obviously you saw at the beginning of this I have chosen to go for normal. So we'll see how badly this guy wrecks me on uh, a, a, a standard playthrough. Yes, he's already doing a lot of damage to me and I'm already in ab uh, abnormal, which I really don't want to be, because bosses become really quite powerful um, once you take them, um, once you go into lunatic, which is like below abnormal. That's like I've run out of sanity completely. There it is. Lunatic mode, I've gone straight into it like the idiot that I am. It's a really cool aspect of the bosses, in fairness. You can try and stay out of lunatic mode for as long as possible um, by using sanity potions, etc. Once you're in lunatic mode, as it tells you here, you've lost your stamina, uh, your sanity completely. You ain't never getting it back. Forget that you even have stamina potions now. They just don't exist. Um, that now means I'm running the rest of this boss fight on lower health. He gets nastier attacks. That's, I think, the blast. Yep, so we're going to back up. Um, I'm at lower health, he gets nastier attacks, and everyone has a bad day. Because of course we do. That's how these things work. Going to get those attacks in. Run backwards and heal up. There we are. Whoa, okay, I'm not getting as wrecked as I thought I would. Um, <laughs> he says, oh, 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 no, 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 I missed out on the execution. No, I didn't. There we are. Execution. Not quite enough to kill him. But I think the next hit should do it. There we go. And that is our first stage here. Woo! Down he goes. That is our first stage here of uh, Pascal's Wager. 
Now I'm not done here in Hedgem. Um, as I said, I am going to come back and we're going to have a look at some of the secrets here. I do want to kind of do this as a full run. Um, we're going to have a look at everything um, in Hedgem as it offers. So if you do want to kind of use this as a guide and check if you missed anything, then we're going to do that as well. Then I will move on to the next area. And I do recommend you guys play through this again, because as I said, I'm not going to sit here and play through all these cutscenes. There's some really cool characters, but I've seen a lot of this already, um, and, and I, I don't just want to kind of let it play out, or the videos are just going to be massive. I'm going to talk about what's going on storyline-wise. Basically, here, Terence falls unconscious, and he sees that woman that he's chasing. When he wakes up, everyone's like, yeah, but she wasn't there. What are you on about? Like, there was no one there. You were on your own. It was just you at the top. Um... We found you, we dragged you back here, there was no one there, you know, kind of what's going on. Um, so as you get a nice little bit of storyline. It's about this point in the game where things start picking up storyline-wise, and you start to see actually what's really going on. So, I'm going to skip through all of this, and then we are going to quickly level up and use stuff here at the altar. And we're not going to go to Adamina just yet. Here we are. Plenty of these to dedicate. So let's dedicate as many as we can, see how many level ups we can grab out of this. Oh, there we are, all the way up to Ultra level 7. Nice, so do some level ups. We're going to add some strength, and I think vitality or vigor. Let's put some vigor in. Think next. Now strength is nice and high. And here we now have talents. So talents are how you kind of modify what's going on. The one I recommend straight off the bat here is health potion stock. Get that. Put a chip to Mundus in it, and bam, you are now able to have three health potions rather than uh, four health potions, rather than uh, three or four health potions, I can't remember how many it is, um, rather than just your basic standing stock. Once you get your first Immundus, do the same and take that up, and then once your first Immundus crystal. Basically, you'll see that there are different types of things here, like here, health potions evolved, the bigger effect from the health potion. I can put a chip to Mundus in to get the first one, then I need to put an Immundus in for the second one, and a Mundus crystal in for the third. It means you can't just upgrade instantly everything to max you do have to start spreading some of it or you save onto your bits and pieces now again we've got different things here as well um, it's quite interesting to go for some of these additional attacks um, Terence does start with the lunge attack you get some bonuses to like execution attacks and things here as well and every character gets their own cool talent trees um, special I think is where you get most of this yet yeah, parry is added there let's add backstab I've never really used the backstab though I put it on my first character, my first run, I've never really used it, so let's leave that one. Let's go into Sanity, actually, and upgrade our maximum Sanity by 5%, because it sucks going into uh, the Insane mode. Anyway, what I am going to do very quickly, just before we go, is, as I said, I'm going to jump back to uh, here. This is the map, and you can choose which area you want to go to, and you'll see there's two areas here for Hedgem. There's the Obscure Village West, the one where I was talking about how you can do this, and Obscure Village East is where we first jumped in. Now, if I'm going to jump in on Obscure Village West, it's because I just want to talk about the Colossuses, Colossi, because they're mentioned a lot in the story, you hear a lot of talk about them early on, and there's this, like, what on earth actually are they? Well, basically, that's the Colossus there, the sun. The thing that looks like the sun is the Colossus. When you get closer, you'll see that it's kind of like a half-giant tree thing, and that big sun is kind of like its head. And those are the Colossi, and they are the things that are giving light to this world, um, and stopping people from going marred. And Hedgem's Colossus appears to be fading, and I'm dying to a bloody snail dude. There we are. It looks like it's about to move, so you go up to the top there to have a look at what's going on. As I said, I'm going to run through here now, and I am going to start unlocking these secrets. Anyway, I do hope you guys have enjoyed this first little look here at Pascal's Wager. I am loving this game so, 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 so much. The combat is really, um, really comfortable. I'm really enjoying how that plays and how it feels. Um, the sound direction, the music, the sound effects is really awesome. The new systems that they've added, like how the altars work, how the different characters interact, um, how you level up using like the bones. It's a really cool Souls-like. If you're into Souls-like games, this is one I genuinely would recommend checking out. And yes, as I said, I am using my Razer Jungle Cat controller for this, um, just because I really like using this controller. It's comfortable and it, you know, it sort of keeps me going. But 
you can comfortably play this with the touch screen controls. You can see them on screen here, um, like you've got your heavy attack, your block, and your standard attack there in the middle, along with a dodge button. And you'll see that when an enemy comes up, you actually get this little icon. It's flashing at the moment. It'll disappear in a second. It, you, it's like a little warning that tells you there's an enemy nearby. It's your lock-on button. Um, it's all actually really easy to do if you're going at it uh, on a touch screen. I'm not going to say it's easy, you know, easy is the wrong word for a Souls-like game in anything, but y y I don't feel like you're massively penalised for using the touch controls rather than using a uh, using a controller. I actually quite enjoy both, I just personally prefer using a controller on this one because it makes me feel like I should be playing something like Dark Souls and that's always good fun. But I think that's there, the absolute singing of praises that I can do for this game. Um, it does feel like a Dark Souls game. It actually feels like a proper Soulsborne, which I really, really like. Anyway, folks, let me know if you've played Pascal's Wager and how you're finding it. Please don't give me any spoilers in the comment section down below. And if you do enjoy this video, subscribe for more, ding that notification bell, and I will be back with part two of Hedgem, and then moving on to the second area of the game in a future video. Thanks for watching, folks. I hope you've enjoyed this one as much as I have. Happy sailing, and see you in whatever the heck this world is called.